Okay, I'm going to go ahead and get started. So hello and welcome to the Open Education Network Summit. Thank you so much for joining us for today's first session entitled Your Discomfort is Valid, Supporting Big Feelings in Open Pedagogy. My name is Tanya Groves and I'm the Director of Educational Programs for the Open Ed Network. If you're not familiar with the OEN, we are a community of higher ed organizations working together to make education more equitable, accessible, and affordable through open education. Before we begin, the OEN is housed at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities, which is located on traditional, ancestral, and contemporary lands of indigenous people. The university resides on Dakota land seated in the treaties of 1837 and 1851. We acknowledge this place has a complex and layered history. This land acknowledgement is one of the ways in which we work to educate the campus and community about this land and our relationships with it and each other. We are committed to ongoing efforts to recognize, support, and advocate for American Indian nations and peoples. Please feel free to acknowledge the indigenous people to whom the land you are situated on belongs in the chat if you feel so inclined. I'll now be handling this handing this session off to Carla Myers from Miami University. Carla is a member of the Summit Planning Committee and she will introduce the session and monitor the chat. Hi everybody, thank you so much for being here today. A few housekeeping things before we get started. This webinar is being recorded. Um, for that reason, you have been muted. The video transcripts and slides will be posted to the OEN's 2021 YouTube Summit playlist after the summit has been concluded. And I will drop the link to that playlist in the chat in a moment. Um, we do have two groups presenting this session today, uh, as was mentioned. Each group is going to present for approximately 20 minutes and then take questions for the remaining part of their half hour. To submit questions for our presenters, please use the Q&A feature in Zoom. The questions are anonymous. We will not be able to get to every question, but we will try to get to as many as we can. The chat will be a space to share additional comments or reactions, um, if you like. We are committed to providing a friendly, safe, and welcoming environment for all of our attendees. You can learn more about the community norms, and uh, there's a link that I'll share with you on that in a minute. Um, please join us in creating that safe and constructive space. The hashtag for the summit is hashtag OEN Summit 21, and then join us on Twitter, Twitter at, at open ed underscore network. Um, and now today, please join me in welcoming our presenters. Our first presentation is going to be Your Discomfort is Valid, Supporting Big Feelings in Open Pedagogy. Our presenters are Amy Hofer from Lynn Bennett Community College, Sylvia Lynn Oh gosh, Sylvia, I should have asked you how to pronounce your last name. I'm so sorry. Um, Hannick, and please correct that if I got that wrong, from CUNY. Liz Pierce, also from Lynn Benton Community College. Lori Townsend from the University of New Mexico. And Michaela Willie Hooper um, from Lynn Benton Community College. And I'm now going to turn it over to our presenters for Your Discomfort is Valid. Good morning. My name is Michaela Willie Hooper, and I'm the OER and textbook affordability librarian at Lynn Benton Community College. Sylvia Lynn Hannock, first year experience librarian at LaGuardia Community College, and Liz Pierce, chair of the Human Development and Family Studies program at Lynn Benton Community College, and author of Contemporary Families, are presenting with me today. Thanks to Lori Townsend, Learning Services Coordinator at the University of New Mexico, and another vital member of our research team for putting together our presentation. And the person who pulled this group together is Amy Hofer, the Statewide Open Education Program Director at Open Oregon. Our project originated when Liz and I were discussing the emotional challenges for the 13 students who were co-creating an open textbook for LBCC's Contemporary Families course. I reached out to Amy and she brought in Sylvia and Lori. Together, we discussed different theories we were familiar with that might explain the emotional experiences that this particular type of open pedagogy work seemed to bring up for the students. So first, I'm going to give a speedy overview of some of the lenses that we looked at these experiences through. Then Liz will talk about some of the ways she worked with students to support them through the experience. And finally, Sylvia will present a visual model and accompanying metaphors that may potentially be helpful 
to others embarking on similar projects. Underpinning all of our discussions was an awareness of the importance of scaffolding and interpersonal interactions in the classroom. Lev Vygotsky is the founder of social constructivism. He coined the term, the zone of proximal development or ZPD. The ZPD is the gap between what learners can do and what they cannot yet do on their own. Learners can accomplish what is in that gap with the support of others, students, as well as teachers or facilitators. In other words, the ZPD is where the learning happens. When teachers provide appropriate support for learners to get to the next level, removing that support as it's no longer necessary, they're scaffolding. While Vygotsky focused on children, adults too will become frustrated if they are not sufficiently supported with challenging learning. When Liz and I initially talked about student identity shifting in this project, it sounded to me like transformative learning, a concept I was familiar with because I had previously explored it in connection to information literacy. Jack Mesereau used the term transformative learning to describe adult learners grappling together with new knowledge, leading to a transformation of perspective. A limitation of Vygotsky's ZBT is that it assumes an established competency all learners are trying to achieve. Transformative learning positions students as capable of expanding upon these set competencies and bodies of knowledge. When a learning community grapples with the contrasts and contradictions between diverse personal experiences and an established body of knowledge, new knowledge can be created and identities transformed. Mesereau acknowledges that anxiety exists when learners are in the classroom as they ponder how to navigate the world following an epistemic shift. When Amy came into the conversation, she thought it sounded as if students were experiencing discomfort because they were in a liminal space. Liz's students were writing textbook chapters underpinned by new knowledge they were still integrating into their personal lives. This would account for feeling unqualified for the assignment and highlights the essential need for scaffolding. Jan Meyer and Ray Land, the theorists who developed the threshold concepts approach, explain that entry into the liminal space happens when a learner's concretely held beliefs or knowledge are challenged and they are unready to let go of their pre-existing view of the world. In the liminal space, we confront what we don't know or think we know and build up the courage to dismantle our incomplete or flawed understandings. Learning in the liminal space is often uncomfortable, unsettling, and scary. Learning in the liminal space can also be exciting, inspiring, and clarifying. Challenging learning experiences, after all, can be both comfortable, can be both uncomfortable and rewarding, or they can be frustrating full stop. Laurie made the connection to brave and space spaces. Arau and Clemens originated the concept of brave spaces as a transformative recasting of the well-known and often criticized safe spaces approach. The safe spaces technique emerged from social justice educational practices where students and instructors gather together to engage in challenging conversations about race and ethnicity, gender, and other complex, risky, and deeply personal issues. Arau and Clemens noticed that participants would often conflate safe with comfortable, and therefore express frustration when the safe space also included challenge and discomfort. They shifted away from the concept of safety to that of bravery in order to facilitate real engagement on social justice issues in spite of the personal discomfort that participants experienced. Particular attention should be paid to discomfort expressed by students who are members of marginalized communities. Using a safer brave space approach in conventional classes can result in these students feeling forced to share painful personal anecdotes or make arguments defending their own humanity in order to facilitate the learning of others. These learning lenses helped us focus on different aspects of the students' experiences, which Liz will now talk more about. Hi, I'm Liz Pierce, and I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about the book project and the students who participated. Then I'll talk about co-creating frameworks and cultivating self-awareness and care. A link to the published book is available on our handout. 
First, I invited all the LBCC students who had taken the Contemporary Families class over the past year, which is about 300 students, to participate in the project to create a new free and openly licensed textbook. My motivation was to include diverse voices from, from the very beginning of the project. So from structure to chapter content to choosing ancillaries. Most open textbooks, like most commercial ones, are primarily written by white upper middle class people like me. And I believed it was critical that people from diverse identities and experiences be involved. My main criteria in selecting students was that they demonstrated the ability to express themselves in any format, talking, brainstorming, art, journaling, or writing. This resulted in 13 community college students from a diversity of majors, identities, and life experiences who committed to participate over a six to nine month period. Students were energized by knowing that they would make contributions that would affect the learning of future students. Madalena was one of the first students who stepped up to participate. Although students were excited and motivated, they were also entering the unknown. Discomfort, frustration, or fear can stall students when they start to work in the open. Open educators need to ask ourselves we are, whether we are asking more of our students than we realize. And I found I had underestimated how much fear these students might have joining me in the liminal space. I was able to keep students involved in this project via my own vulnerability with them, our relationships, and by drawing on my teaching toolbox. But it was only by collaborating with this presentation's group of educators that I was able to more accurately label what those strategies are and how they connect with learning frameworks. What I'd like to share with you are basically some solutions or strategies that help separate productive and unproductive discomfort and give students ways to contribute when they are facing challenges that may arise from being a beginner acting in the real world space of public open pedagogy. The first category of solutions that our team identified had to do with the co-creation of frameworks within the Open Pedagogy Project. Instructors can encourage student agency in the development of course structures like assignments, rubrics, syllabi, other components. In addition, instructors can exercise their own agency to prioritize flexibility within assessments and the general course structure. So right from the start in this project, students had one general course outcome to meet to contribute to the openly licensed textbook. Within that broad outcome, students wrote individual learning plans as their first assignment. The plan acknowledges that this class will be a different experience with unique challenges and opportunities. Students drafted their plans, taking into account where they were starting from and where they hoped to go. This learning plan is distinct um, from a course contract as it includes multiple spots to pull over while in progress and to make adjustments. A link to the learning plan is included in our handout. And here we'll hear from Sebastian. We can prepare students for working in unfamiliar territory by scaffolding assignments and taking into account affective responses to learning. Educators can offer an out for those students who might find it scary to perform in front of an unknown number of strangers. 
open educators should consider what the stakes are for individual students and when it may be necessary to mitigate discomfort. Let me introduce you to Helen, a white 40-ish single mother who works in the prison system and broke down one day at the start of our seminar session. She received support in several forms that allowed her to come up with her own solution for moving forward. Each student is working in their own ZPD, Zone of Proximal Development, which itself may shift as students experience emotional responses. Viewing the ZPD as situational is another way to create brave and safe spaces where students are well supported by the instructor until they're more able to close their own knowledge gaps. Instructor flexibility can anticipate and mitigate the frustration that students may feel if too little or too much is asked of them. Providing multiple paths allows students to manage their own learning. Sarah, a biracial single mother in her 50s was exhilarated about joining the Open Pedagogy Project and she anticipated being able to work on topics related to her family's experience with incarceration and domestic violence. She made invaluable contributions to the chapter structure, topic choices, and research, but she found herself stuck when it came to writing about these personal subjects. Simultaneously, I was looking for a student to convert data into graphs for a different chapter she volunteered and created multiple graphs for the text. A year later, we talked periodically. She continues to express some disappointment in herself while recognizing the value that she added to the work in other areas. The second category of solutions that our team identified prioritizes self-awareness and care. Within self-awareness, we focused on cultural humility and metacognition fostering compassionate and critical self-reflection as well as care for self and others enhances open education work while decreasing anxiety. Lori's work on cultural humility in libraries structured our thinking in this area. Briefly, cultural humility involves the ability to maintain an interpersonal stance that is other oriented as well as a commitment to remedy power imbalances and structural inequality. This open to learning from others stance is important for the instructor to model, as well as for the students to practice. Cultural humility can inform how instructors respond to imposter syndrome, helping students more accurately assess their expertise and the value of their contribution as a voice currently missing from the discourse. For example, in this textbook project, Ona, a biracial student in her 20s, had a goal to become more confident in speaking up. The supportive environment of a respectful listening and the explicitly stated value of including voices that are often missing contributed to her personal growth and the breadth and depth of expression in the textbook's contents. Open pedagogy asks students to take ownership of what they produce while learning and to explore the boundaries of the course via their personal passions and interests. Metacognition, the awareness and control of one's own cognitive processes has both an affective and a cognitive component. 
When students are practicing new skills and are taught to be more aware of their cognition, they can use strategies to self-regulate and observe themselves in action. In the learning agreement for this project, I included questions intended to foster the metacognitive process, such as, what strengths and skills do you bring? What are you afraid of or worried about? And what is your purpose in being here? Brandon was going through a powerful transformation that affected not just his view of himself, white privilege, his own white privilege, but also his relationships with family and longtime friends. He faced rejection from his family. When he shared this loss with the class, Julia responded that she was experiencing rejections in her own family as she developed and discussed greater understandings of privilege and oppression. A third white student empathized while expressing that she did not fully understand the concept of white privilege. An environment that emphasizes care can foster peer support, self-awareness, and authentic dialogue. Care for self and care for others balances critical self-reflection for students and for faculty who are engaged in open pedagogy and transformative learning. I'd like to share one more quote from Madalena with a summative comment about how she met the goals she had set for herself at the start of this writing project. Using the learning theories outlined by Michaela and the solutions summarized by Liz, our group developed a visual model in order to explore our ideas about how open educators can raise or lower the stakes of an open pedagogy assignment. We suggest thinking about this model as a tool for scaffolding assignments. For example, you might not want to assign work with the highest challenge level for the most public audience if your students aren't prepared by first testing the waters with lower stakes work. When working with individual students, the model may suggest flexible approaches that allow students to opt out of components of the assignment that are causing unproductive discomfort. Where instructors observe students getting stuck in a liminal space, the model may suggest a shift to something different that's within the ZPD, but not triggering. A copy of this model is included in our handout. Here is an important caveat. All models are wrong, but some are useful. Even though we're presenting a visual model shaped like a grid and that borrows X and Y axes from math, our intention is not to imply precision. We hope that you will understand the model as a gradient with fluid borders and not a chart. It explores relationships between different ideas for assignments. In general, we suggest that assessments requiring high support for students will represent a high challenge level for the instructor. The more open things get, the higher the challenge level because the instructor needs to provide more support. Support may be technical, emotional, logistical, or something else altogether. Challenge level can represent the time you have to prepare for a new assignment, the emotional labor required to responsibly support student work in the open, accessibility concerns, or familiarity with a new technology or platform. Our hope is that this model will provide you with a starting point for scaffolding the affective dimensions of your open educational practices. We expect that our model will need to be edited or even redrawn entirely depending on your local context and individual expertise. So we're also including a blank version on our handout. Open pedagogy can be one way of building the kind of deep engagement necessary to activate a shift in identity from passive novice to seeing some yourself as an active member of a practitioner community. 
Students may develop the confidence to authentically participate in the discipline, gain the sociological imagination to connect their experience to wider societal currents, or resist dominant narratives by contributing their unique story. Still, guiding students through a shift in personal identity can be a challenging process. With the various backgrounds that our group brings to this discussion, there was a shared insight that emotional reactions to participation in open pedagogy assignments aren't necessarily bad, but that perhaps there are ways to anticipate and prepare students for the affective impact, impacts of deep learning. Successful open pedagogy considers the cognitive, social, and emotional stakes at play and prepares students for a new sense of self and a way of being in the world. Open pedagogy strategies may seem like extra work for faculty, but as illustrated by the student stories in this presentation, are worthwhile when led effectively. When you're building a roller coaster, you want to build a safe one. You don't want a malfunctioning lap bar. You don't want a roller coaster with a harmful narrative like Disneyland's Splash Mountain, which is based on the racist 1946 film, A Song of the South. You do your best to build a good roller coaster. You can't make everyone have fun, but you build a roller coaster that is just as likely to be safe as it is to be fun. And this lets you invite your riders on with confidence. We hope we've given you some ideas for building a thrilling but emotionally safe ride uh, on your next OEP roller coaster. And now a quick road recap through some of our slide credits. And we welcome your questions. <laughs> 